Thank you. Thank you. Up in the t- cheap sheets, sh- cheap seats, cheap seats. Thank you so much, everyone, for that rounding applause. Paul, how are you feeling today? Uh, I am doing great. I just checked while I was grabbing my coffee. My air conditioner reads at 106 degrees outside. So you're inside then. This is not coming live. Definitely inside. <laughs> it is a perfect 73 degrees in the house. Well, wonderful. Your hair is looking magnificent. Isn't it? This is uh, yes. February. This is what since February looks like on me. Wow. Congratulations. Tiffany, hello. How are you? Good. Minus the jackhammer happening outside. Hence me being muted. We, we Can you hear, hear it? it? So No, we can't hear it. Wow. So. It's so loud. Just an FYI, don't drop a jackhammer on your leg. It hurts, especially 60-pound jackhammers. Oh. They hurt. Yeah. Thanks for the tip. Yep. Just, you know, in case you were thinking about dropping one on your shin, you should not. And with that beautiful segue, let's talk to our guest today, Angela. Angela Chin, how are you today? Welcome to Tanzu Tuesday. Thanks. Happy to be here. Yeah, we're happy to have you. And uh, as you can tell, we're a very professional group. From that beginning intro, you can, you can tell we've got everything buttoned up like pros. Really, really <laughs> set it off with a bang. That's right. Well, welcome everyone out there. Thank you for watching. Hopefully uh, you are all ready for an amazing fun time with Angela. She's been talking about custom controllers. Now, I do feel like there was a little bit of a uh, miss here with using, well, no, I actually take that back and I, I just answered my own question about why not using K's for all of your custom controller Kubernetes. I just realized why that's not a good thing. So never mind. you did a great job naming your show. <laughs> I don't, it was not meant to be a joke. It was meant to, I'm glad that I see, I like, I'm slowly learning. I can edit in my head before it just comes out. I like how um, the slowly learning was a down. So it's not, it's not it a, it's not, well, it's, it's before it comes out the mouth. It's a from the brain into the mouth thing. <laughs> oh, I was off last week, so I'm a little rusty. Paul and uh, Tiffany, how was your Kubernetes workshop last week? It was fun. We went a solid hour and a half over so wow uh, wow pretty exciting i think five you had w- five and a half hours watching. instead of four hours yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we had who, who like the full five and a half that was that was quite a number i think we, the okay. official workshop was 60 people uh and then we had a bunch of folks on twitch following like along. half of it were still uh, there at the end yeah great apparently yeah. well good good for you congratulations um, we're, we're excited that, uh, actually this platform has a lot of different ways of sharing great information to include your workshop and, uh, and also, uh, this will, I'll segue this into our announcements next week is the spring one tour, which if you haven't registered, go to spring one tour.io it's Josh long talking about spring tips and reactive spring. And that's July 22nd and 23rd, starting at 9am Pacific standard time. The first day goes for two hours. It'll be Josh just talking again about all things great uh, spring tips and reactive spring. And then the next day we'll have an hour long fireside chat with Josh and I'm assuming a few other people. So that should be really great. Um, That'll be a I lot just, of fun. I say assuming I just haven't heard of the other people so I can't shout them out yet. Um, but yes, it's, it's, it's going to be a great two day experience. So next Wednesday and Thursday. Um, I was just was, upset they didn't take our recommendation and they didn't call it the Josh Long experience. Yeah, the Josh Long experience. It's it's what I call whenever you see Josh Long live. Right. And so this is going to be the Josh Long experience. Uh, Would have been the the unofficially name. named. Yes, unofficially named Josh Long experience. Officially named Spring One Tour. I, I just yeah. realized I own the Twitch. I can call it whatever I want. It's true. You can. Yeah. <laughs> and this is when Paul realized power. Power uh, corrupts absolutely. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. There it is. All right, uh, Uncle Ben. Thank you. Springone.io. The talk tracks have been announced. Go to springone.io. Uh, again, the conference is all virtual. It's September 2nd and 3rd of this year. Uh, it's going from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the two days, all online, all free, and also. Now you can build your path to great production by checking out all of the great five different tracks with all the live sessions. Uh, of course, they'll all be recorded and posted later, but um, you know, spend those two days kind of formulating 
uh, you know, what you want to see live, and then you can also mark what you want to see later and watch them later. Uh, so again, go to springone.io and register. Um, oh, what I was trying to segue with the Spring One tour uh, is that if you don't register, you can still watch it on our Twitch channel because we do live stream that on our channel. Right, Paul? Right. Absolutely. Oh, also, Bob, by the way, exciting news, mm -hmm. Sweet Killer mm -hmm. 9 is in. Wow, yes. I know yes, you were worried. Sweet Killer 9, well, bienvenue, Sweet Killer 9, welcome in. Uh, so happy we also to have see Spencer. Uh, we Spencer's have, there, yep. Uh, Electric Zen, do we, do we know yeah, who Electric been, Zen is? Or that person has also been in too, so I don't know. Yeah, who we've got uh, Brian McLean. We've got uh, Kota Prabhu, I think we've had him before. Uh, we yeah, have we're... Jose Ciesco. Oh, how are you? Are you able to like see the actual people on? Yeah, if you look to the right of stream chat, there's a little thing with pe like people, and you click oh, on it. Oh, the whole time? The whole time. The whole time. So is yeah. that in this way, or is that in this way? That's that's wonderful. All right. Oh, that's uh, that's in this way. <laughs> <laughs> Silly got me. Uh, and yes, uh, a reminder to, to those uh, that are watching, uh, if you haven't already uh, followed this page, it's the new page. So follow this page to stay up to date on all of our VMware Tanzu happenings. Uh, two more announcements before we move on. Uh, you could, If you want to learn more about Kubernetes besides today, uh, TGIK, uh, that is uh, a YouTube channel. Thank goodness it's Kubernetes. And they've got 123 and counting shows, uh, all based on Kubernetes. And then VMworld. Uh, VMworld is also now going all virtual. Uh, that is September 29th and October, through October 1st. Again, all online. Go to vmworld.com. Uh, click on the content catalog. And there be, there's, I, I, I can't even begin to explain how much stuff is happening <clears throat> with And all VMworld. these things are free. And it's all free, everybody. So take advantage of this knowledge. Um, and then if you haven't already, come join our community, the VMware Tansy developer community. We're, we're, we're just expanding and growing. We're blogging. We're sharing. Uh, Tanzu.tv, of course, has all this great information to watch. So that's my updates. Uh, back to Angela. Angela, thank you. Hi. Hi. Sorry. Thank you for dealing with that. Yeah. No, lots of good information out there. There, there is. I mean, that's the the one upside to this is that we're we're still able to get information out to people. It's just not in person like we like, where we can get drinks afterwards and delicious food. But, uh, but then you, know, you don't so. have virtual backgrounds. That's right. You don't have virtual backgrounds. <laughs> so, can, you know. You know, and if you really need to have a drink, you know, we can we can go to our, our one of our favorite pubs in the world in Paris, and we'll have a virtual drink at the Golden Promise. So, it's. It's not quite like being there, but virtually we're there. Have you ever been, are you a whiskey drinker, Angela? Are you a... No. No, okay, that's fine. You don't have to be, it's quite all right. <laughs> Paul and I are. Tiffany, I don't think I've asked you, are you a whiskey drinker? Not really. I, I'll i take small sips of it here and there, but overall it tends to burn. So I don't really like so it. So you, A, you're a whiskey trier, which is great. Uh, and the, the other thing next time, if you try a whiskey, it's the second sip. The first sip will always blast your taste buds and it kind of is like, ah, you know, it's just a lot. But the second one, your taste buds are a bit more acclimated and you can taste a few more of the different things. So anyway, that's just, there that is. Um, so Angela, where are you right now? Where in the world are you? I am in Los Angeles, California. Nice. Excellent. And I'm sure it's yeah. hot there today. Oh, yeah. Are you on the coast side? Are you on the west side? I'm downtown. Okay, so, so unfortunately, it's basically the desert. Yeah. at this yeah. point yep. so pretty yep. hot not as hot as as paul with 100 and whatever six but... yeah. <laughs> and paul's from Google another says country 82. where they use celsius so he's actually using celsius it's 106 celsius <laughs> that's right oh gosh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah i lived in alhambra and then altadena so it always got super hot there so if we ever wanted to to avoid the heat it was like long beach to just get on the coast and beat the heat well, I'm glad that you're uh, safe and sound in LA. And uh, give us a little bit of background. Uh, how long have you been de uh, kind of developing and, and working with, uh, kind of said Kubernetes, which is kind of like enterprise type of software stuff? Yeah. So, well, 
Let's see. I've been working on uh, like cloud platforms for about four years now. Um, working first at, I guess, Pivotal now here at VMware right. Tanzu. Um, working on a lot of things related to like networking, routing. Um, so really liking to sort of see how you can get the bits to communicate with each other on it's the an platform. Important part. Yes, <laughs> very important part. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, yeah. you can say pivotal. You don't have to, you know, it's not like he who is not to be named Voldemort or anybody who is. <laughs> so yes. Get banished. I, yes, no. that's right. <laughs> uh, well, cool. Um, and then also just uh, unrelated, do you have any pets? And if you don't, what pet would you have? I don't have any pets. I don't know if I'd have a pet. Fair, fair. <laughs> Some people don't have them because they like live in an apartment, they can't have pets or, or whatnot. But I think just... it's just too much responsibility. Mm -hmm. I don't quite trust myself enough. I mean, cats... like an outdoor cat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Outdoor cats is like, it's not it's even like a put pet food on the point. porch. <laughs> that like automatic like an automatic dispenser or something and then oh, gosh. Just, like <laughs> get the raccoon hands coming up from below have you guys seen that little video trying to get the i want a raccoon the... that's what i'd want i want a trash panda pet. a trash panda there they are <laughs> So well, good. Uh, Paul uh, Paul takes that philosophy, and he and his wife just feed all the neighborhood wild animals. So yeah. he has two cats, but also a fox and a possums and raccoons. We have and, five uh, baby raccoons that come around every night right now. Oh my gosh, you're taking pictures and sending those to me. All right, and, and we had like three or four baby skunks around the other day, and they That's all run around with like their tails all sort of <laughs> intertwined and so we, we now call a, a group of uh skunks a swifter of sp skunks nice uh, yep yeah, very very good yeah paul um i need pictures for proof because this sounds adorable and i can't see it myself <laughs> all right. pictures or didn't happen that's the motto um yeah don't uh, get sprayed where i live in the suburbs uh east of the bay area or east of uh, oakland san francisco and so uh, one night I, I go on walks uh, most evenings and uh, I call it my cool down walk. Oh, there it is. Paul, you got to talk so it can oh. be on the big screen. Oh, there it is. Can you see me? There we go. That was the baby skunks. Uh, oh. You're still sending me it anyway. Yeah. All right. she, she needs to have that as her background on her laptop. Um, Could be on my phone. I mean, you know, just everywhere. Endless possibilities. That's right. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I went on a walk the other night and it was, I saw a deer like real close to me. I got hit in the chest by a bat. Oh, dang. And, oh. and then, and then I heard, like I had my earphones in, so, but I heard like some rustling off the side and it was a skunk with its tail raised and pointed at me. And I took a little bit of a jaunt after that to uh, get away from the skunk who was ready to fire. So. Uh, I didn't get the Swiffer of skunks where they were all being all adorable, holding holding tails all intertwined. Now, I've spent enough time with you, Bob, that I'm pretty sure you could hold your own against a skunk. hey -oh! I mean, if if I wasn't loaded, though, I guess is the... <laughs> they're, they're, like, ready to go. You have to get me on a good... Uh, after uh, Tacos Waimas. Um, so, or Enchiladas Waimas. There it is. Um Anyway, all right, enough about, thank you so much, Angela. I'm sorry you don't have any animals, and I'm also not sorry you don't have any animals because you choose not to, and that's your choice, and it's great. Yeah. Um, all right, are you ready to go? Yeah, let's, let's get ready. Sharon's the screen. Um, She's like, I was ready 14 minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> what are you people doing? <laughs> now 15 minutes, just exactly. kidding. Exactly. Yeah, I was about to. I was about to change it. <laughs> well, it was really 14 because there was a, there was a, a one. Okay, one. done. All right. Okay. And with that, I guess I can get started. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so yeah, today um, we'll be talking about crafting Kubernetes custom controllers. Um, and I wanted to start because this is my first time here um, at Tanzu Tuesday doing an introduction, although I didn't realize that beforehand, um, you know, Bob would pepper me with questions and the slide essentially becomes redundant, but we have it here anyway. Um, so I guess I just wanted to give a little bit of background, introduce myself, who am I, 
Um, so I'm a developer at VMware, um, currently working on CF for Kates and other Tansy products. I know, um, I think Tiffany did a Tansy Tuesday about CF for Kates. Um, I've been working on, like I said, cloud platforms for about four years now. Um, I enjoy talking about things related to like network and like network policies, um, tinkering around with different open source projects. Um, and I like to share what I learn with other people, which is why I'm here today. Um, in my free time, I love all things food, as you can see from the picture, especially desserts. Um, and in quarantine or sheltering in place, I've definitely had to balance the amount of baked goods that I've been creating um, with doing a lot of running and yoga. So got to have a balance in life. So eat lots of food and then run marathons to burn it off. Um, but enough about me. Um, today, what I'm sure most of you are really here to learn about is Kubernetes custom controllers. So a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about here um, is we're going to start by talking about custom resources and then custom controllers, sort of level setting on what they are, what value do they bring, why should I even care about this topic. We'll then discuss a few of the many different projects that allowed you to sort of build your own custom resources and controllers. And then we'll spend the majority of the time uh, trying this out and doing some live coding, which fingers crossed will go well. And we'll end with some general best practices that maybe we weren't able to hit during the demo, but if you wanted to go out and really build your own custom controllers for production considerations you would really want to be making. So with that, I always like to start by asking why. So why are we talking about custom resources and controllers? Um, why should we care about them? What value do they add? Um, and so, you know, then going even a level up from there, uh, I think to understand why we care about custom resources and controllers, um, we can ask sort of the next higher level question about like, why do we even care about Kubernetes? So there's a variety of different answers that you can give to this question of why Kubernetes. Um, but I generally focus in on um, the answer of extensibility, right? So with Kubernetes, um, it gives you a lot of extensibility in terms of like toggles for both operators and developers. You can really customize it and make it your own to fit your specific needs and use cases. Um, and then there's also extensibility in the number of ecosystem projects that you can use. Um, you know, looking just at the landscape, um, there's so many different technologies, different projects um, that if you have a use case in mind or a specific need, there's probably something in the Kubernetes ecosystem that you can actually be deploying and running um, so that you don't have to you know, reinvent something from scratch. And so when we look at these answers to like why folks may want to use Kubernetes as a platform um, and then think about why we care about custom resources and custom controllers, um, custom resources and custom controllers really come into play on the second of these two bullet points. Um, when we think about extensibility and number of ecosystem projects. Um, because custom resources and custom controllers make it easy for third party vendors, other community members to easily integrate with Kubernetes and build value on top of the platform. So with that being said, what exactly are custom resources and custom controllers, right? So starting off with custom resources, um, when we think about Kubernetes, you know, we have main nodes and worker nodes and the interface which a user will actually be communicating with the Kubernetes cluster is the Kube API server, which is backed by a CD database. Um, so 
you know, any YAML that you're applying to your cluster is just being stored as key value pairs in etcd. Um, and so this makes it so that it's really easy to be storing information on Kubernetes, because as long as it abides by the format of a key value pair, you can be storing that information in etcd. And so a custom resource is an extension of the Kubernetes API that's not necessarily available by default in um, just a vanilla Kubernetes cluster. And so um, put it another way, a custom resource is essentially just a bunch of data that you can store in etcd. So it's you know a bunch of key value pairs um, and it allows you to use the Kubernetes API and etcd to store information. Um, and this is really nice, right? Because um, if you have information that you want to be storing, you can just piggyback off of what Kubernetes already provides you instead of having to provision your own database to store information, set up networking um, rules around that, manage the uptime. Um, instead, again, you can really just rely on one of the core components of um, the platform. But of course, at the end of the day, custom resources are just objects and data being stored in etcd. Um, and nothing's actually doing anything with that data. And so this is where custom controllers come into play. Right? So the custom controller is a program that can watch for and react to Kubernetes objects. Um, and so custom resources and custom controllers need not be hand in hand, but you'll usually see them bundled together because that's where you get the most bang for your buck um, and it's the most powerful. So thinking about having both a custom resource and controller, um, by sort of bundling the two and creating them together, it allows you to have a fully declarative API. Um, and so when, again, we think about ecosystem projects in Kubernetes, uh, many of these come in the form of custom resources and controllers. So when you think of things like Istio, Linkerd, Kpack, so on and so forth, um, you'll see that if you look at the projects, there's a series of custom resources and then controllers that are watching for these resources and then acting on behalf of them to achieve some other set of outcomes. So with Istio, for example, you'll get networking outcomes. Um, Kpack, you'll get some build outcomes, so on and so forth. Um, so like we said, though, while you see the most benefit by having both a custom resource and controller hand in hand, you don't technically need both of them. Um, so there may be reasons why you have a standalone controller you've built without a custom resource. Um, for example, your standalone controller may act on already existing resources. Um, so for example, you have a controller that was for failures of resources being created. Um, and since I, I think we can hear something on your end, Paul, as an FYI. But um, so like an example is like a controller that, you know, is watching for a failure of resources being created and sends a Slack message to let the team know. Um, or like maybe you want to do like some modifications. Maybe, you know, you actually want to be extending an already existing resource um, to have like additional actions. And so you just want to have a standalone controller, but you don't need your own custom resource. Um, on the flip side, having a standalone resource without a controller, honestly, is, is less beneficial um, because at the end of the day, a standalone resource is just data being stored in etcd. Um, nothing else is happening to it. Um, you might choose to create a standalone resource um, with a future intent to create a controller, um, or it may be the case that your team may not care to create a controller that acts on that resource, um, but you want to have a, that resource there as an extension point for some other team to be able to integrate with through the creation of their own custom controller. So with that being said, um, you might be wondering, how do we actually build both custom resources and custom controllers? Um, so building custom resources is pretty straightforward. 
um, Kubernetes has a custom resource definition um, type. And so you can just create YAML of kind custom resource definition. Um, and that's a resource that allows you to define custom resources. Um, the more interesting bit is when we get to building custom controllers um, because a custom controller is, you know, at the end of the day, a program that's going to have to be long running, watching for resources, um, acting on it, perhaps creating other resources or generating other outcomes. Um, and so there's numerous projects that are actually out there to help you with sort of the scaffolding um, and framework for creating custom controllers. Um, obviously, this list is not exhaustive, but when I think about custom controllers, um, some of the main projects that come to mind are Cube Builder, Operator SDK, Controller Runtime, and Meta Controller. Um, so we'll do a brief overview of each of the four, and then we're going to choose one of them and jump into seeing just how easy it is using these projects to um, just jump right in and get started on crafting your own custom controller. So um, first, we'll talk about Cube Builder. Um, so Cube Builder provides you scaffolding in Go, um, and behind the scenes is using uh, both the controller tools and controller runtime libraries um, to implement a lot of the logic. Um, one of the cool things about Cube Builder is the testing framework um, actually includes support for a standalone etcd. So you can see that you're like storing your um, custom resources correctly um, and you don't need a full Kubernetes cluster. Um, and then lastly, Cube Builder has added a lot of great support for webhooks. Um, so both um, like admission webhooks as well as like um, some validations so that you can have like a lot more logic um, ingrained to not only just have your custom resource and controller running, but also, you know, have some like checks on are people generating my objects correctly. Um, and the webhook support is something that differentiates it from other, um, other projects out there. So uh, the next project is Operator SDK. And to be completely transparent, I actually um, still haven't had a chance to kick the tires with this project, um, but I know it's another very popular um, project out there for creating your own custom controllers. Um, so it also provides like scaffolding and go um, with controller tools and controller runtime, providing a lot of support for the project. Um, one of the key differences is that in addition to just having like a um, support for like, op, like writing your own operators in Go, it also supports Ansible and Helm operators. Um, so if you maybe like aren't as familiar with like controllers or aren't as familiar with Go, but you know a lot about Ansible or you know a lot about Helm, um, it might be a lot easier for you to get up and running and test things out. Um, so the operator SDK might be a good choice if this sounds like you. Um, and then also it provides integration with the operator lifecycle manager, which is focused a lot on like the day two operations of uptime and upgrades. Um, the one thing, as we previously mentioned, is there's no support for webhooks. Um, and actually operator SDK folks note that if you do want support for webhooks, that maybe you should piggyback a little bit off of Kube Builder um, to get those features. So the third project is controller runtime, um, which has actually been referenced already by both Cube Builder and Operator SDK as sort of part of, as the core library that it's using to be um, implementing a lot of the logic for your custom controller. Um, so controller runtime is a set of Go libraries for building your controllers. Um, the only reason I would say that you want to use controller runtime instead of Cube Builder or Operator SDK. Um, is if you want to have more fine-grained control for your setup. Um, and I think even saying that, you definitely want to take a step back before you decide to use controller runtime and ask yourself, like, what is it that I really want to do that I can't achieve by either using Cube Builder or Operator SDK? Um, because one of the things that using 
pro these projects gives you is sort of guardrails, right? Um, so that you aren't doing anything that's not Kubernetes idiomatic. And so if you're finding that what you want to do isn't fitting into either of those projects, um, it would be highly beneficial to ask yourself, is what I'm doing, does that even make sense in a like in the Kubernetes ecosystem? Or am I trying to do something that's just completely off the rails? Um, after asking yourself that, um, if you feel like you're doing something that still abides sort of by best practices, then by all means, um, I think controller runtime is a great project to be using then to build your custom controllers. Um, and last but not least is MetaController. Um, so what MetaController does is it extracts away a lot of like having to like run your own server um, and really instead you can focus on implementing like the logic for your controller and the set of functions that you want your controller to be performing. Um, because of that, it supports multiple languages. So it's really nice if you want to write um, your controller using something like JSON it, for example. Um, and instead, you just install Meta Controller itself, and then you can set up a series of sort of like webhooks that it should be calling out to um, for your various different like controller needs. Um, I found Meta Controller to be really useful when I want to just like quickly prototype something out or um, extend an existing resource. Um, but I will note like the future of the Meta Controller project is really up in the air. It hasn't been, I think, actively developed on for about a year now. Um, and there is some uh, conversations that have been ongoing on whether or not to like donate Meta Controller to like um, a different group or, um, you know, really put the deprecation like warning on meta controller but nothing's been decided yet um, so meta controller really great for prototyping but if you want to be building a controller that you eventually are running in production um, i would avoid using meta controller as a framework for now okay so with that i think of the four projects um, the one that i think is really easy to get started with and also, um, you know, not only kick the tires with, but is useful for, you know, eventually building out um, controllers that you would want to run in production is Cube Builder. And so let's go on to doing some live coding. So I'm going to move this out of the way for right now. Um, and we're going to start completely from scratch here. So in my terminal, I'm literally going to make a new directory. I'm gonna call it a plant factory because yesterday I was thinking about like, what do I wanna call this? And I was like, you know, I really like plants, um, really like fruit, it's summer, you know, Things are really nice, even though it's very, very hot outside. Um, so we'll think about plants. Um, and as a warning, we're not going to do anything like very, very exciting in relation to plants. Um, I'm not the most creative person, but we can just enjoy, think about plants, think about nature, things like that. Um, but anyway, from our earlier discussion, factory, just... I'm surprised you're not doing the ice cream factory. Oh, uh, I know. I did think about that. Um, you'll 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 see though. Uh, you know, you can eat plants too. True. Um, all all natural here. We're trying to be healthy. Um, but in the plant factory, we have absolutely nothing right now. As I promised, we're going to start from nothing and actually end up with a functional controller. Um, so I'm actually not in my go path. So I'm just gonna start by like, well, actually, you know what? I'm going to start with a cube builder in it. And we're going to see why um, it's a problem that I'm not in my go path. So um, to use cube builder, you'll obviously have wanted to install um, the CLI on your machine. I already did that. 
Uh, so I guess I am cheating a little bit here. Um, but let's say cube builder in it, and then you pass in a domain. What? Cube builder not found? Really? Hmm. Things are already going off the rails. Um, hmm. Really? That is perplexing. Well, I guess we really get to start from the very beginning then and download Cube Builder. So if we go to the quick start, oh, it says I probably moved it to user local Cube Builder. Uh, oh, maybe it's just not in my path. Okay, let's export the path. Then I think we should be good to go. So now, ah, beautiful. Okay, we're back on track. So running Cube Builder in it, we see right now it's failing to initialize the project um, because I'm outside my Go path. So I'm going to do Go mod init just so we can bypass this. Um, and so doing go mod init, we can say, you know, maybe I would expect my go path to be tansiovmware.com slash plant factory. And so now that we've initialized our go module, we can run cube builder init. Cool. So another thing I'm going to do is just do a git init so that we can see all of the different files that are being created or modified at any different time um, while using Cube Builder. So right now, if we look at the um, directory, we see that we now have a bunch more files. So this is all of the scaffolding that running Cube Builder init just did for us, other than, of course, the Go mod file. Um, so at this point, some things that are cool um, to point out is we have, for example, a make file. So Cube Builder gives you a make file and will um, that allows you to sort of easily um, set up different things. So you know you can run like make tests to run your tests. Um, it has make install that will allow you to actually be installing your custom resource definitions into your cluster. Um, it has make run, so you can run your um, controller locally, um, things like that. So that's one of the nice things. Um, the next thing to note, I guess, is um, it also has a config. And so config is where it'll be placing all of your different like Kubernetes YAML files. Um, nothing too exciting yet, um, but you can see things like, um, I guess, like a role binding so that um, your controller will have like permissions for different roles. And this will get updated as we create custom resources. Um, the custom resource definition will end up in config. Um, and then lastly, it also initialized for us like a main.go. Um, and so right now it's pretty sad. Um, it just has some logic for setting up um, our manager. And the idea is that you can have multiple controllers that are being managed by this central manager here. Um, so it just has sort of some logs and initial code for setting things up. Um, so nothing too exciting, but we can just add this all so that when we run our next command, we can see what's actually being generated when we want to create a new custom resource. So now that we have everything initialized, let's actually create a custom resource. Um, and so here we can do that by saying like Cube Builder create API. And if we look at like the create API um, command, it will allow us um, you know, to scaffold a Kubernetes API by creating a resource definition and or controller. 
So at the end of this command, we should have both um, the spec for a new custom resource as well as um, an outline for that custom controller. Um, so in this case, we can do create API. And so you wanna give like a resource group and that group is sort of like, you know, that overarching um, collection of like resources. So for example, when we think of like core Kubernetes resources, there's like a group that's like core, there's a group that's apps. Um, you'll see like, you know, for example, with this view, it might be like networking, um, so on and so forth. Um, and so we can say here group, um, we said we're in the plant factory. So we'll say the group is plants. That's the commonality between all of the resources we'll create here. Um, we'll pass in a version. Uh, because we're just mucking around, I'm gonna do V1 alpha one. So really no one should be relying on anything here. Um, and lastly, we can do the kind of resource. And so, you know, Paul made that crack about ice cream, but we're gonna be healthy and we're gonna do a kind fruit because a fruit is a plant. And so we can see the first thing it asks is for us to create, is whether or not we wanna create a resource for this, which we do. And then it also asks about a controller. So we say yes to both. Um, it does some more scaffolding for us. And so now we can see um, it modified a couple of things, including main.go. And it also added some additional config as well as an API and controllers directory. So you can take a look at what changed in main.go. So actually, if we just get diff, um, we can see that now we have this like plants v1 alpha one, we're adding it to the scheme. And then we actually are setting up a controller that's called a fruit reconciler. Um, and we'll take a look at what exactly the fruit reconciler does in a little bit, uh, but we can see that, you know, now our main function actually has a little bit more additional logic. The manager will be managing our fruit controller. Um, so looking at, again, the new, um, new folders here, the first one we'll take a look at is API. So if we look at API, we see that has a V1 alpha one, and then we have fruit types. Um, and so we can even see at the beginning of this file, it says, edit this, it's scaffolding for us to own. Um, and so what we see here is that we have like fruit spec defines the desired state of the fruit and then the fruit status. So, um, you know, we have foo as the only field in the spec. Um, I don't really think foo has much to do with fruits though. Um, so we can start by saying, usually you carry in your spec for it to have something like a name. Um, so we'll add a name. And then we can do like maybe a couple of additional fields like type, like what type of fruit is it? Is it a guava? Is it a chirimoya? I don't know. There's so many fruit. Um, and then lastly, let's do something like a mount. Um, and so that can just be like, how many of that fruit do we actually have? So do a mount. That looks good. Um, you can also update the status and note so you can insert additional status fields here. Um, and so like the status field, right, is something that a user should never be updating on their own. Instead, you're expecting um, controllers and different programs to be automatically updating the status um, based on, you know, actions that have been performed on that resource. Um, so, you know, there's lots of different, um, I guess, resources out there that note like what types of like fields you might want to put in the status, um, you know, timestamps, information about what's running. Um, in this case, you know, I'm just going to say something like created and actually let's say it's like a Boolean. Um, and so we can just say created empty and then we're good. 
Um, so one other thing um, that we can first note here is we have, you know, a bunch of comments in the scaffolding that Cube Villier gave us, but we also see some comments um, that look like something a little bit more, right? Like there's a plus cube builder object root true. And so you'll see this throughout um, the different files in cube builder. And this is what um, you know allows cube builder as a project to know exactly how to be reacting to the different structures you're creating, the different functions, so on and so forth. Um, so that when you run make and you update things, um, cube builder is able to pull the correct information out um, to be generating the right, um, the right like YAML files, the right configuration, so on and so forth. Um, so you definitely, if you're ever doing cleanup, don't want to be removing um, comments that look like this. So now that we've updated some stuff related to our fruit spec, we can actually go ahead and rerun make um, and see what got updated. Um, so I'm going to just add everything again. So everything's good. And then rerunning make, we should see some updates. No. You know what? I think what I actually have to run is make manifests. So uh, make manifests is what will actually take information from the API um, files and update um, the manifest files. So the custom resource definitions themselves. Um, and that doesn't get called by a simple make, I suppose. Um, and we could have looked at the make file to figure that out. Um, but we can see that it actually added this new um, directory called config CRDs bases. And if we look there, we actually have something called plants.tanzu.vmware.com fruits. Um, and we can see that it is the spec for our custom resource definition. Um, one thing I always think is sort of like funny looking at this um, is, so if we take a look, it has all the spec, the kinds, list kinds, plural, singular, so on and so forth. Um, I guess it's like funny uh, because if we look, for example, at um, the property of name, we see the description actually is a foo is an example field of fruit, um, which like, the first time you look at it, you might be like, what? Like, where did it get this from? Um, we can see that, for example, type um, and amount don't have any description. And that's because if we go back to our fruit spec here, we see that the comment above name is actually the description of foo as an example field of fruit. Um, so Cube Builder is like pretty smart, right? It will actually take the comments you've put above different fields and will use it uh, when generating your custom resource definition. So, you know, this is like, so this way your API and then the information in your custom resource definition can stay in sync with one another, which is really nice. So it's like name is the name of the fruit, for example. And then we could do something like type is the, I don't know, species of fruit. And then we could even do something like amount is the number of fruit, right? Um, so if we add everything again and we run make manifest, we can see that um, it actually got those comment changes that we just made and it updated the descriptions accordingly. And so um, now we actually have a CRD that we could apply to a cluster and then we'd be able to store objects of type fruit, uh, which is really nice. But again, as we previously mentioned, like the CRD by itself um, and storing custom resources is just 
storing key value pairs. Um, and isn't that interesting unless you have a controller that's acting on it? So now that we've sort of done all the setup related to actually being able to create our custom resource, uh, we can now take a look at actually writing a controller that can act on it. So we had noticed previously, but completely ignored it, that there was a controllers directory that was added here. Um, and so we can see here that there's controllers and there's a fruit controller. Um, and so again, we see some uh, notes for cube builder at the top here. And then we see a very lovely comment that says your logic here. Um, so the function called reconcile here is sort of the main logic for our controller. Um, and so the idea of a reconcile function is that it's going to get a request that's coming in. And then we want to take some level of action um, on that request and then return a result. Um, and so in this case, um, what will happen is we'll get a request that has information for a specific type of fruit resource. And then we'll actually want to be acting on it to do something. Well, I would say something cool, but I'll let you be the judge of that. Um, so what exactly is the request that we're getting in, right? So if we take a look, um, a request actually only contains the information necessary to reconcile the Kubernetes object. Um, and there's like some scaffolding and like setup done elsewhere in the code so that we know that the requests coming in will only be requests for fruit resources. Um, so if you created like a deployment object, for example, that's not going to call out to this function, right? Um, the fruit reconciler dot reconcile should only be called when we see some change to a fruit resource. So let's implement some logic. So we'll uncomment these to get a context in a log. Um, and so the first thing we want to do is the request only has enough information so that we can identify the fruit object, but it doesn't actually have all of the information um, that would be listed in that resource. So uh, the first thing we want to do is actually get the entirety of the fruit resource that's coming in so that we can act on it. Um, and so what that looks like is we would do something like r.get. Um, and so if we look at the fruit reconciler, we see that it has a client, which is a Kubernetes client. Um, and that's really helpful for like doing things like get, create, update, so on and so forth. Um, and so we can do an r.get, we pass in a context, um, we pass in a key that allows us to identify it. So in this case, that can be request.namespace name. Um, and again, like a namespace and a name together is a unique identifier. So this will allow us to correctly identify the fruit resource that we're trying to retrieve. Um, and then lastly, you actually want to be placing that information into a resource. So we'll assume we have something like a fruit resource, and we can instantiate that right here. Um, and we can say it's of type v1, plants v1 alpha 1 fruit. Um, and so this will successfully put um, all of the information about the fruit resource into our fruit object here. Now, of course, um, get returns an error. So we can do a little bit of error checking here. So we can check if the error happens, probably want to log. Um, that the error occurred and we can say like log error, error like failed to get fruit. And we can just return an empty result and then the error. Let's see, undefined, oh, I always do this. 
So let's actually instantiate these two. Save. Okay, no errors right now. Great. Um, so now at this point, we should have access to our fruit resource. Um, and we probably want to be doing something with it, right? Like um, creating some other objects, notifying something, um, so on and so forth. Um, and so, like I said, I'm not the most creative. So I was thinking that, you know, we could just create like a deployment based on the fact that we got a fruit resource. You know, like pods are sort of like fruit, right? Like, I, I don't know, um, really, really pulling at strings, right? But I think it still gets the point across of, you know, getting a fruit resource and then creating something else. So we could do something like um, r.create. And we could say, again, you pass in the context. Um, you pass in the object you want to create. So let's say like desired fruit. Um, and so we'll want to actually be creating our desired fruit. Um, and so this is the part where I will cheat a little bit um, because you don't want to see me actually have to make an entire deployment from scratch. So well, you don't copy. you don't know the entirety of the Kubernetes API off by heart. You can't just like flick that out with a couple of <laughs> clicks of your keyboard. Shut you know, down. shut the whole thing down. I I would say this is more of a reflection on my my typing capabilities, right? Because that, that's a lot a lot of keys to type, you know. So that is. I, I'm saving everybody from watching me type out each and everything. Well, we've, but, got we've got time. We've got time. <laughs> yeah, we've got plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> Re rewind three minutes. No, let, let, let's start from scratch. Uh, OK, you got me. I just don't. I'll want listen to, to the trolls. <laughs> so we can see here that my create desired fruit deployment um, right here has like all of the information about a deployment. So you have your object metadata, the spec, um, and you know has a template for um, the pods that the deployment should be creating. So um, I guess like the main interesting thing, which really isn't that interesting, is that um, each of the pods will just have a very simple application be instantiated um, that should say like hello from a and then the fruit name, very, or I guess the fruit type. I don't even remember what I wrote, but it's very exciting. Um, now, I'm sure you're all aghast. There's like a lot of like red marks right here. Um, and so this is like one of the like maybe a little bit more annoying things is that, you know, in Kubernetes, there's so many different groups that have, that are of type V1. Uh, so you want to differentiate, right? Like the deployment object lives in like apps v1, um, the pod template spec lives in like core v1, um, but they're all like package name v1. Um, so again, if we like come up here, and this is where I just admit I don't actually ever remember these references off the top of my head. Um, you can, we can just paste over here, you know, some import paths. So apps v1 will reference Kate's IO API apps v1, core v1 is the core v1 package and the meta v1 is the meta v1. And so if we save, now everything is happy. Um, and so now, we can create the desired fruit deployment type. And then, you know, it's mad that I'm not doing error checking, which, you know, is fair. You should always check your errors. Um, so we'll do that. Um, and we'll just return that we 
failed to create fruit deployment. All right. And so at that point, we will have created our desired fruit. And there's really nothing else, at least for an initial iteration, to be done. Um, if you're wondering, like, well, should we actually be returning something in control.result, right? Like, should we just be returning a null object? Like, what, what is the expectation to be passing back? Um, if we, so the result contains the result of a reconciler invocation. Um, and this struct only actually has like two fields on it, a requeue and a requeue after. Um, and so generally like what happens is like, you'll make an update to an object. It'll hit the reconcile function. The reconcile function will do its logic and that will be the end of it. But if you want your controller to constantly be reconciling for that resource, um, you can use the requeue to say, actually, I want you to add this back into the queue of resources that I should be reconciling. Um, and you can also specify like a time restraint on that. Um, and the reason you might want to do that is if you don't trust, like for example, the developers on your platform, um, because right now in our situation, if somebody created a fruit resource, we'll go ahead, we'll create a deployment. Uh, but let's say, I was like, why is this deployment here? I don't really want it. I could go ahead, delete it, and um, that deployment would just be gone. But if I set the requeue to true, then um, somebody could go and try to delete this deployment. But because I'm constantly checking for that resource, um, I would keep you know, recreating that deployment. So making sure that the state of the world is the state of the world that the controller expects. Um, so that would be the reason you'd want to set the requeue. Um, in this case, I don't want to because I'm doing a create. Um, and so if I requeued, I would probably get an error message about how this desired fruit deployment was already created. Like, why are you trying to create it again? Um, and so in the current state of the world, as this code is written, I would get an error. Um, so I don't want to do that. Um, and we'll just return an empty result. As, so, so the requeue is effectively result. just closing the um, feedback loop, right? So it has that, you know, does that Kubernetes mm -hmm. controller thing of always validating desired versus actual? Yep. Yeah. Cool. So now we should have enough logic, fingers crossed, I didn't forget anything, um, to actually try to see that things are working. So um, if we take a look again at the make file, we can see that you can run um, a make install. And this will actually install the CRDs into your cluster. And then you can run a make run. And that will run against the configured cluster in my cube config. Um, so right now, I'm just targeting a cluster that I stood up on GKE. Um, we can see that we're able to reach it. Um, we can also see like if we get CRDs, um, there's nothing to do with fruit yet. So that looks good. Um, I guess one final thing before we run make install is that we'll actually want to have a fruit resource that we um, add to the cluster. And so um, actually very helpfully, if we do to config, there's a samples um, that we can modify. So its name is fruit sample. Um, I'm gonna put everything in its own namespace called fruit. And then uh, unfortunately, the one thing is that it doesn't update the spec. So you're going to have to go ahead and update the spec yourself. So we can say name, Fruit sample type, uh, I don't know, like guava and amount, let's say like five. And so we can save that. So now we have a sample ready for us. Um, over here, 
I'm going to go to my plant factory. Um, and so first we want to run make install. And so we can see, um, and the one thing QBuilder does do, um, and this is another difference between it and operator SDK, um, is that QBuilder uses customize um, under the hood for configuring and like managing all your different YAML files and um, crafting what it's going to apply. And so now if we do K get CRDs, we can see that we actually have a CRD for fruits, plants, Tanzu, VMware.com. Um, so then over here, we're just gonna do a make run to run the controller locally. Um, you know, eventually if I got it into a place that I was like happy with, you could build the controller as an image and be running that on your Kubernetes cluster itself. Um, but right now it's fine to be running locally. Uh, we can see that um, it's logged that it was able to um, start the controller, which is our fruit controller. Um, everything seems to be fine. We don't have any error messages yet. And then we can come over here and, and well, we can create a namespace called fruit because that's the namespace that I wanted to put my fruit sample in. And so now if we do, and I guess the final thing is as a promise for no tricks, if we see get deployments dash A, we can see I don't have any deployments in the fruit namespace or anything related to fruit. Um, so we can do a K apply F samples. Um, and we can see almost instantaneously to when this fruit sample was created um, that we have a note that we were able to successfully reconcile the fruit controller um, with the request of fruit name or namespace fruit name fruit sample. Um, and so if we get deployments again, we now see that we have a fruit sample deployment. Um, and if we get pods in the fruit namespace, we see we actually have five fruit sample pods. Um, and then lastly, like just to make sure it actually is everything we set up and is running, um, I have like a very simple fruit now. Hmm. Well, we can create a very simple service.yaml. Um, and so in the service.yaml, we could do something like API version v1. We can create a service so we're actually able to communicate with our kind service, I guess, um, communicate with the pods and see that they actually are saying hello from a guava. So we can say namespace is in the fruit namespace. Um, and then we can do something like ports. Uh, target port 80. And then I guess we'll have a selector on uh, what is it? It's like plants. Well, we'll take a double look at the selector in a second. Um, and then we want to do the type to be load balancer. So let's save that. Let's take a look again at our, um, I guess we can just get our deployment. Um, so we can see on the deployment that what we are checking based on is this label. So that could be our selector here as well. Let's see if everything was set up right. And if 
we get everything, uh, we see that the load balancer is pending right now. Um, but once it's up and running, we should be able to curl it and see that we get like a message hello from a guava, which will be pretty cool, right? Um, I guess another thing to note, as we talked about with like the constant reconciliation versus not, um, is since we decided not to requeue the fruit resource, um, you know, the last message we see here is successfully reconciled and we don't see any further attempts um, to be ensuring that things are constantly up to date. Um, so if we were, looks like our load. If we were to restart mm -hmm. the operator, would it attempt to reconcile it one time and then yeah. not break you again? Okay. It, yeah, we, we can take a look at that next actually. Um, so we can see, so we'll curl first really fast. You know, it might take some time. It always does. And actually, I guess it doesn't hurt. Okay, we'll wait for that. So, so the question was like, would it try to reconcile it again if we stopped and restarted the controller? So we rerun make run. Um, so it's running everything and we can actually see we're getting errors. Um, so we see um, we got an error when we tried to create the fruit deployment because it already exists. Um, so restarting the controller, it has no notion of what it previously reconciled uh, because the controller right now is stateless. And so it doesn't have an idea that it previously knew about this type of fruit. Um, and so since in our logic for the controller, the only thing we were trying to do was create, um, it's going to try to create and run into this issue. The the interesting thing, so like you can you can definitely get around this. A lot of people will do like a create or update um, type of function, and so that way, um, if it already exists there, you know you have more of the logic in your controller, similar to that of like a kube cuddle like apply, um, and so you shouldn't run into the error in this case, um, but. I think that's something that's like a little bit lower in the controller utils, controller runtime package than like a core function on the client itself. Um, okay, uh, and so like, mm -hmm. I was gonna say, I've seen the yeah. pattern where I think people do an update and then check for a 404 error and then catch that 404 and then do a create. So it sounds like that's kind of a cheat way to get that functionality you were just talking about. Mm, mm -hmm. But yeah. I would imagine yeah, there's that could probably a, another way. There's probably a a more like there's probably a, a, a real way to do it in the in the Kube Builder though, right? Because it would I would imagine that that should be something that Kube Builder would have functionality to help you with. Yeah. So, well. We can take a look at that um, in terms of like what it exposes via the client. Um, just a final quick note, networking takes a little bit of time, but we do see hello from a guava. So everything's set up correctly, hooray. Um, but if we look at the controller here and we look at the client that we're provided, um, this is, is this where I wanna be? I don't actually, hmm. yeah, so the writer, it actually only gives like a create, um, delete or update. Um, so like one thing that would be really nice to have is like a create or update um, function, but unfortunately it's not being exposed here. So um, you could definitely do like the update, get back an error and create. Um, or like there are other like packages that are like bundled in in both like controller runtime or controller tools um, that can give you like a little bit more of that functionality. And so I've seen um, another thing that people do is they'll use Kube Builder for like the majority of their scaffolding, um, but for like the little things like, you know, making sure that it functions more like an apply than a pure create. 
um, they'll actually reach down like a little bit, like a level deeper um, and use some of the tooling that exists um, in like controller runtime. By the way, Brian McLean said in chat that uh, you actually have helped him figure out an issue that's been bugging him for weeks. <laughs> awesome. Good to hear. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I know that the like, it's not snazzy in terms of, you know, oh my gosh, like seeing some really, really exciting, like, beautiful like UX like thing result from creating a fruit object or like, you know, I didn't create a free fruit resource and then have like fruit delivered to my door. Although like you probably could if you wanted to go like really deep in the weeds, like, you know, have a fruit resource that like calls out to some API that adds it to your like, I don't know, like Whole Foods card or something. And then like, you're all good. But it is pretty exciting. I think that in, you know, like, 20, 30 minutes or so, we were able to go from a completely empty directory um, to, you know, at least having the basic logic for a controller here. Um, there's like a lot more that we could be doing. One thing that we hadn't touched yet is we, we added a field to the status of created, um, and we could be updating that. Um, but I know we're going to run into a different set of issues there, um, but why not? Uh, so <laughs> we can do on the fruit, we can say status.created. We can say we created it. Um, and so one interesting thing actually is QBuilder does present to us a r.status. Um, and so this will actually, you can see it says like updates um, the fields corresponding to the um, status sub resource. And so like this is sort of nice because it's like updating only the status um, and not the spec. So you're less likely to have like collisions with other things. And so you can do like update context and then we can pass in a reference to the fruit object that we just modified. Um, and then here we can say like fail to update fruit status, um, save that. Uh, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, and so now we can try to run things again. And so we're actually going to get well, I guess we get our original error here, which is that we already have the deployment. Um, so let's go ahead and fix that. Um, so if we delete the deployment fruit, fruit sample, and then, and again, like, because we aren't re-reconciling the object, it didn't try to create it again. So we're going to have to rerun. Um, so what we'll see here, um, and I was I was actually literally doing this right before, right before this session, um, and it, it, it was really bothering me, um, was that I saw a fail to update fruit status. Um, and that was like, what? Like, I totally added to the, um, to the status field that there was um, a status of created, um, right? We like look at the API, fruit types, and it's like, yeah, I, def I definitely added a, a created. But if we take a look at the CRD, well, actually, I guess the status here has created too. Um, but this is one of the things that has to do with like Cube Builder. And so you actually have to specify, I guess I called it plant service. So you actually have to specify that it's going to have a sub resource of a status. And so if we go back here, I believe 
we can add it right now. I didn't copy it correctly. You can add this sub resource status. So we have everything here. I'm just gonna add it to see what happens. So if you do make manifests again, and you run a make again, we see that this file was actually modified. And if we look at the diff, we see that it added like the sub resource status, which hopefully should allow us to then actually update the fruit status. Um, so again, this is a little bit of annoying part of we'll need to still re-delete the deployment. And then if we make run again, Did you need to reapply the CID? To the yeah, I totally did. Good call. Um, we can make install. Everything got recreated. Delete the deployment. Make run it. And so. It, we see now we got this successfully reconciled, um, but now we're getting a whole slew of errors after again. And that's because a change to the status field actually will trigger another reconcile. Um, so you'd want to implement logic of like, if the only change is to the status field, please ignore it. Um, but otherwise what's happening right now is we're actually modifying the fruit resource so that is in a sense re-queuing it. Um, and so it's trying to re-reconcile and it's running into that issue of that the fruit sample already, or the deployment fruit sample already exists. Um, so I was like debating whether or not to go down this path because it's not always the funnest to like leave things in a, well, we know why it's failing, but not everything is beautiful and great. Um, but I think it sort of shows that as you like continue on the path of making your controller more robust, there are like other considerations that need to be made. Um, and I think it's a pretty good segue to leave the live coding part of this um, and sort of wrap things up with other considerations um, that you would want to make when building a controller. Now, are we going to do all this again in Python now? <laughs> no. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> yeah. So instead, we're going to just talk about general best practices, and then hopefully you're now well equipped enough to go kick the tires yourself. Um, so some other things you'll want to consider is things like, um, well, first is the idea of owner references. So um, in this specific example, one of the things we did was we created deployments based off seeing a fruit resource being created. Um, but one thing we didn't set up was the fact that that deployment should be quote unquote owned by the fruit resource. And so you'll wanna set up owner references if your controller is actually creating um, other resources um, so that you, know, you have good garbage collection practices. If I delete the fruit resource, then it will trigger the deletion of the deployments. Um, so that's something that you would want to be implementing in your controller. Um, another thing is finalizers. So again, like in terms of garbage collection and deleting things, um, there's an idea in Kubernetes of adding a list of finalizers to your object. And so that way, when somebody tries to delete it, what actually happens is it triggers the start of a deletion um, in so far as it will set like a timestamp for like a for a delete um, and then all of the controllers will actually see that deletion time timestamp and will go and perform some cleanup logic before removing that finalizer so a finalizer is basically just like some text that's on a resource that says you can't delete this resource until all finalizers are removed 
Um, and so this is really nice if, again, your resource um, actually triggered the creation of something outside of Kubernetes. Um, so owner references will help with garbage collection for the creation of um, resources that are in your Kates cluster, uh, whereas finalizers allow you to have that additional logic so that you can clean up resources that perhaps you created as a result of seeing a resource, but these objects aren't in the cluster themselves. Um, another thing, um, and we touched on this already while we were um, doing the demo, is that you probably want to have constant reconciliation happening um, so that you make sure that your controller really is the source of truth for what objects are in your cluster. Um, and then last but not least is as you start to take your custom resource definition and custom controllers to production, you'll want to think about versioning your CRD um, and the implications there with like, how do you version and how do you upgrade? Um, and, you know, doing a quick like cursory search, there's a few good articles out there um, about what to do with respect to versioning. Um, and with that, we will not write things in any other language. Um, and that's all I had planned for today. So thanks so much. Woohoo. Woohoo. Thank you. you Good job. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. How do you feel? I feel like I just talked for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> an accurate. An, yeah, an hour, I would say. That's a pretty good amount of time. Yeah. This was awesome. Yeah, I like how Paul also took credit for, uh, I'm glad we could help you today. I, I, I was amused at that too. I was just like, oh, okay, <laughs> okay. I think all of y'all are hanging out too much yeah. with each other today. Uh, I did not catch that at all. Oh, well, no, it's on the... It's well, on it, was the, the uh, it was in the... Oh, okay. <laughs> when Brian McLean said, McLean said, thank you so much for, for helping me. It's something valuable. And, and Paul wrote in our thing. I'm glad we can help somebody today. It's like, Angela, thank you for helping Brian. Paul had nothing to do with it. Um, anyway, yes, thank you. So uh, what kind of food will you celebrate with today? That's a great question. The possibilities are endless. Aren't I've had my eye on a mango passion fruit custard pie. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, that sounds really okay. Wait, what? What's a custard pie different than? How how is a custard pie different than just a custard? Well, it's on, crust? It's on a pie crust. You, yeah, yeah. You, you have the pie <laughs> crust, and then you have a custard filling. And then this pie has like sliced mango on top. Now, are you talking about making this or, or, or buying one that's oh, made? Oh no, no, it's from it's from my favorite, one of my favorite restaurants in LA, oh. called Republic, uh -huh. and their their baked goods are very good. And I have their baking cookbook too, so nice. presumably I could make something similar eventually. Well, as they now say, run to it. eat, run to eat. So. <laughs> We all want it. Paul helped me uh, figure out how to smoke a pork butt this weekend. So that was delicious. Oh. Yeah. I should have talked more food with you instead of the animals thing. I didn't know if you had an animal or not. We talk about our animals a lot on the show. And so that's why I was bringing <laughs> it up. I have three dogs, which I call monkeys. So anyway, mm. they sometimes make appearances. But food, that's what we needed to talk about. Yeah. Speaking of We're food, good. Bob, I had the classic yeah. blunder today. I got up this morning. I'm like, I'm going to order something delicious for lunch. So I ordered a, uh, a Nashville hot chicken sandwich from a new place that just opened. Yes. For mm. delivery good. at 12 o'clock. And I discovered that their system, when you say, uh, I want to select a time, it defaults to the following day. So how's your chicken tomorrow? Delicious. So, so twelve thirty comes <laughs> along. And I'm like, mm, when when am I going to get my chicken sandwich? Uh -huh. And then it dawned on me when I was checking and I saw the text and it said tomorrow. So yeah. future Paul is going to be very thankful. Delicious. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if it if it like swapped uh, AM and PM, but this is a whole different deal. I would also be okay with getting it at midnight. Fair. Fair. All right, Angela. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank thanks you. for having me. Yeah.
Yeah, thanks to all our <clears throat> regular viewers. Again, don't forget to uh, add this new channel. So favor this new one. We are now VMware Tanzu, no longer the make jar, not war. And um, now in we'll theory, the existing point. notifications should be working. Twitch promised us that it would. Um, right. But if not, you might need to hit that. Was it the subscribe button or the follow button or whatever it is on Twitch? It's a follow and it has a it's heart a next to it, and which I mean, how could you not watch this show and not heart and hardest. follow it? All right. Well, <clears throat> until then, uh, next week, I believe uh, Paul, Tiffany and I are going to walk through some open source stuff. Yeah, that, I think that that's what, we what we're going to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Some, some last minute decision making happening happened behind the scenes. Yeah, we had a, a guest who has some internet connectivity issues that we're just going to push back so that there's no no threat of dropping a call and uh it's fine fine we're gonna have a fun time talking oss okay everybody's waiting for me to vent. okay i will yeah. wrap it up then <laughs> i have an orthodontist appointment okay I have okay, to. you gotta go <laughs> okay well thank you angela thank you all we watch uh good night sweet killer nine i know you're sleeping but you're gonna watch this tomorrow maybe and uh yeah we'll see you all next week Bye bye